Thank you so much, Roger, for having us here on the Isle of Man in your workshop that you actually opened 20 years ago. What really fascinates you so much about watches? I think for me it's the sort of mechanical side of it. I've always been interested in the mechanics of anything really. Um, at school I wasn't very switched on at all really. But give me anything mechanical and you know there's na natural sort of interest there. So I was, um, I suppose I was directed to it through my father. He was collecting a few clocks at the time and I became interested in the mechanics of those clocks. And um, then he directed me in uh, the direction of a course in Manchester. And does that, uh, does that school, that Manchester School of Horology, still exist today? It doesn't actually, no, no. It closed several years after I left. Um, there are now, there is now another course running out of Manchester, one of the Swiss courses, the WASTEP courses. But no, my course um, sadly folded. So, so being here in this workshop for, for 20 years now, running your own workshop, can you tell us a little bit about um, what has happened in watchmaking your career over that 20 years, but what you also think about watchmaking generally? Yeah, so I mean, for, well, I suppose for me, my journey, yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like 20 years really. It's, it's um, just flown by, but for me, I set up the workshop in 2001 and my work, I'm still doing bits of work for George, but really I had to develop my own name in my own right and um, that's something that we've been gradually doing over the years. There is so much work that's been done, you know, basically when we were, or when I was setting out to make watches, I didn't want to make one watch a year as George had done, you know, that was him. I didn't want to follow that. I wanted to go into big numbers. Um, and so now we're doing 15 pieces a year. So um, I wanted something different and I wanted to in some way try and re-establish British watchmaking. So that's been my goal. Uh, we've you know, introduced production, watch production back into Britain, into Great Britain. And um, obviously in our own small way, but you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to do with my sort of watchmaking, what we've tried to do over the last 20 years. So who are your customers then? Who are the people who are interested in British watchmaking while Swiss watchmaking, as we know it, is so big these days? Well, I think what we find is um, people, you know, these collectors who we you know, work with, they're always looking for something different, you know, and they've often been on the journey. They've often bought the Swiss watches and, you know, started off, you know, reasonable watches and getting, I suppose, more expensive and more exclusive as they um, sort of move along their journey and learn more. And again, I think it's them just looking for something again different, just to expand their knowledge and um, understanding of watchmaking and uh, where that can take their collecting, really. So is it mainly uh, uh, collectors or other people who just want one watch by you? We ha I mean, we have had the occasional clients who's literally just... I mean, there's one guy, he said, I've never ever bought a watch before, but I just want one of your watches, and that was it. And he's not a collector per se, you know. Um, but yes, I mean, generally, yeah, you know, our, people, our clients are collectors, and they'll have many, many watches. And are those collectors, usually collectors are um, interested in very unique pieces, everybody wants this personal kind of influence in the watches. To which extent do you, do you work with these wishes of the collector because you have your own collections? Yeah, I mean, again, it depends. It depends on the client. I mean, we are, I'm working with a couple of people now where we are building, or de I'm designing, completely one-off watches for them. Um, I, these clients have been sort of, you know, long-term clients that bought a lot of the other work and so they've kind of progressed into that sort of area. But there are also, you know, my, if you like, the day-to-day -day watches, the series ones, twos and threes and so on, we can still, you know, uh, we still put personalization into those watches and people can have a say when it comes down to material choice or engraving and so on or, um, so yes, there's lots of, 
we're able to create very unique, very individual watches. But still, you must have uh, developed your own philosophy for creating a, um, a watch, and yeah. especially a watch movement. Yeah. Uh, can, us, can you describe that, that philosophy of how your perfect watch yeah. looks like? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I suppose my perfect watch would be um, one of my watches in its sort of original form. You know, so the gilded plates, the frosted plates, the screwed in gold chassons, you know, the real traditional English or British style of watch finishing. And then a very straightforward silver engine turn dial, uh, maybe with a gold inset chapters and so on. So um, for me, I mean, British watchmaking um, has always been very understated. And that's, I suppose, my, my perfect watch. So when a client comes to me for a watch, they are buying my work, my watches, you know, they all follow that sort of basic philosophy. And even if they are asking me to design something original, it's still got to be my style and my, it's got to feel like one of my watches for it to obviously leave the workshop, so. So uh, since we're here, where, where um, George Danich not physically but um, uh, invented kind of the, the coaxial escapement, are you up to inventions as well? I mean, is there anything for complications or um, other functionalities you are kind of inventing as well? You want to invent something? I think for me, you know, I mean, we're still doing a huge amount of work with the coaxial escapement. We're still improving that. That's been a journey. That I started really in 2006 when I built my first um, Series 2 wristwatch, which housed the coaxial escapement. And we've been tweaking that ever since and changing it and improving it. And we've changed the mechanism as a whole. So that work is ongoing. As for individual inventions, I mean, I suppose the Series 4, um, I came up with this idea for a traveling date aperture. Um, and that was completely original, never been done before. And it's been since been copied by several other major brands, actually, which um, is great. I mean, that came out of me wanting to design a triple calendar complicated watch. But I was always put off by the fact that you had a hand which sat across key pieces of information for several days at a time. And um, how do I get around that problem? So, again, I don't set out to be an inventor, as it were. You know, it's, it's, it, it comes about as a result of my watch designing, really. I mean, coming, coming back to the place here, um, what I also uh, find very interesting that you have very, uh, or at least a couple of young people working here, where do you get your, your craftsmen? So yeah, I mean, again, this has taken us a long time to work out, you know, the type of people we need. And um, generally, I mean, they're all, predominantly from, obviously from the UK. Um, they've all worked in the sector, in the service sector generally, you know, there's obviously a big service need in the UK for the watches and so on. So they work within the service sector. They've usually been on a, one of the recognized courses like WASTEP or uh, there's a very good one also in operating out of Birmingham. Um, so they've had a good basic training and then they've had a good number of years of work experience within the trade. They are our sort of ideal people really because they understand the, uh, they may not know obviously the skills that we require, we can teach them those for skills, but they have the basic understanding and, uh, and I suppose the respect for what they need to try and achieve. Right. And if you've got that in there, then you know we can teach the rest sort of thing. And uh, so, but you are still the only watchmaker in the in this in the whole in the sense of the whole um, uh, work, or is there other full watchmakers here? So I mean, no, I mean I'm I'm the I suppose chief designer. I mean I I create the watches, you know I I come up with the ideas, um, I sit down, I uh, will design the watch in its entirety, um, and then we'll go into the prototype phase where we'll build the first one or two sort of pieces and I'll work on those with um, our sort of machine sort of workshop and so on. 
uh, build the prototypes and then um, once we're happy with all the tweaks and changes then we'll go into production. How did you how did you come to the to to this idea of creating, I mean, like fifteen or fourteen watches a year? I mean, is this number has this number some kind of uh, some kind of relation to to its production process or to the prototyping or to the numbers you want to sell or? No, it, it's something that's just um, so. Behind it all is this this sort of approach to watchmaking. So it's, it, we call it the Daniels method. So it's something that, I mean, George, back in the 1960s, late 1960s, he built this first, his very first pocket watch. And uh, it was, um, he was probably one of the first people in history to have sat down and designed and built in its entirety, every single component with a watch. He built a complete watch from the raw material. That's never been done before because up until that point, um, the trade had always been subdivided into different areas, as it is today in Switzerland. But when George was building his watch, the British watch industry had all but disappeared. And so that's why George was forced into creating a single watch. So for me, I'm still re holding on to that idea of um, being completely self-sufficient. Um, so literally raw material enters the building at one end and a completed watch leaves at the other end with no, I mean, I think we buy in about five or six components for each watch, which are mainsprings, jewels, and sapphire crystals and the leather strap. So <laughs> building watches that way is very restrictive because um, um, it slows down the process and you have to have extremely highly skilled people in order to create a complete watch. So. Um, the business model is very restricting in that respect. Um, we can only grow if we can find more watchmakers to help to assemble and finish these watches to the standards that I want. Right. Um, so that's the restricting side of it. You're also applying 21st century technology um, to enable you to, to make these watches, which is, I think, one of the big differences to George Daniels yeah. himself, who did a lot with old machinery and so on. Maybe you can enlarge a little bit on that. What does it really mean? And what, where's the, for you, the borders which you don't cross? <laughs> yeah, again, it's, I mean, that's a very personal thing, really. Um, so in my early days, I was making everything by hand and I would make pocket watches in the same way that George did. Um, when I went to work with George on the Millennium, Daniel's Millennium project, um, we had a raw report um, delivered to us from Switzerland, which contained George's coaxial scalings. And that raw report, I was responsible for finishing and adding on a calendar complication and making the dials and hands and so on. And that was a real shock to the system. And the reason why I was a shock to the system was because for many years, you know, the previous seven, eight years, I'd be making everything by hand, but in pocket watch scale. And when you're making pocket watches, it's fairly straightforward-ish process to work to the tolerances of a pocket watch, which are about one to two hundredths of a millimeter. That's fairly achievable with fairly rudimentary equipment, such as George had. Um, but the problem is when you move to wristwatch scale, those tolerances increase um, to three to four thousandths of a millimeter. And that becomes a challenge. And um, so when I was working with George on the Daniels Millenniums, that was a real challenge working at that scale. Um, and then when I set up at my own, I made nine series one wristwatches. Um, and I also, uh, wristwatches those were. And then I also made a couple of Torbian wristwatches for George, and they were again completely handmade. And is a fascinating project, really was, but they were incredibly difficult watches to make because of the scale. And what I was finding uh, was that you're always chasing the errors through the watch. You know, you're, it, it's um, 
a hugely complex process because of these fine tolerances. And I knew that if ever I wanted to build more than one watch per year, I'd have to embrace modern technologies, manufacturing technologies. And so we bought our first CNC machine in 2005. Um, Which is still a lot of um, work to work with one machine and to have the right people to work with it and to do so small numbers. Oh yeah, I mean it's, I mean the, um, a CNC machine, you know, it's not about just pressing a button and walking away. I mean, they are hugely complex machines that need a huge amount of attention and you need a really highly skilled people to operate them. Yeah. Because um, you're still trying to achieve these tolerances of three to four thousandths of a millimeter. And it's very easy to lose those if your machinist is careless or doesn't fully understand what they need to achieve. So. Um, that, again, that took many years, you know, we'd never operated a CNC machine. The first one that we bought, I was operating with one of my colleagues, Andy. Let's go back to the watches you designed to apply to work for George Daniels. I mean, It was two pieces actually, because the first piece was not his oh, yeah. acceptance. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about this this story. <laughs> I guess you have told it quite yeah. a bit. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> yes. So the first pocket watch I made, I started when I was 19 years old, and um, I finished it 18 months later. And uh, I was working out of a small workshop in my parents' garage at home. And I made it, and um, so obviously the natural thing for me to do was to then contact George and ask if he'd look at it and maybe approve it, um, give me some advice. So um, showed him the watch, and it was anything but congratulatory. I mean, he, as as he said, you know, he said, "Look, you've you've managed to get a watch together that works, um, but the quality simply isn't there. You know, you really need to go away." And focus on these 30, 34 different skills or trades which are traditionally used in the in the creation of a complete watch. For me, the goal was just to get a watch to work, yeah. and I did that. I remember the first time it ticked, um, and I was I was amazed it ticked, you know. And I'd probably been working on the watch for a year at that point, maybe even longer. Did you have? Anybody who looked at those parts from the, the, the standpoint of a, of a craftsman and, and the skills of his, of his field? Or did you just get it out of books? Because that was before internet times. Huh? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, no, so it's majority through books. There was this, um, this guy actually in Manchester who's a, a keen collector of watches. Uh, he's quite elderly now. But um, he invited me around to his house once and he showed me some pocket watches some pocket watch movements which were made by, there's a Tompion and there's a Mudge movement and um, also a Breguet. And, you know, it's really great actually because I hadn't seen these movements before then. And so it's really good just to, uh, you know, see these mechanisms, say that's what I need to be trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, so that was, yeah, I mean, it stuck on my head. It's obviously hugely important for me. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, I mean, Now I was just following George's book. And I, I used to pore over the book. You know, I, I read it several times over. I even used to get a magnifying glass, an eyeglass onto his images in the book. You know, so much so that you could see the pixels and the, the dots in the, in the print. Uh, just trying to glean a little bit more information out of it. So it was difficult, but it's all I had at the time. And how long did that watch take? Uh, so the second one took five and a half years. And wow. that was just because of this sort of, um, this, yeah, I mean, I, I, I knew I was improving all the time. And I think I made the watch within a year, the first watch, and it's working, and it is much better than the first watch. Yeah. Um, but then I look back at the components I'd made earlier that year, and they're of a far poorer quality than what I was making just that week. So I'd go back to the beginning and remake those and then go through the whole watch, remaking all the bits. 
And that process went on for, as I say, five and a half, um, yeah, five and a half years. You, you must have been so excited when you, after five years, showed this piece to, to George. Mm. Oh, this, yeah. This yeah, watch, yeah. I mean, <laughs> could you describe that again? We met George, went into his workshop. He grunted about on the way down there. He sort of said, why did you bring the first watch? It was appalling, as he, as he was. And, you know, I thought, oh, crikey, this isn't going well. But um, he, we got into the workshop and I put the watch in front of him um, at his bench and he looked at it, opened the box. He turned it around in his hand. He um, asked to see what was, opened the back of the watch. So he did, and he looked at the mechanism and turned it round in his hands, and then he started asking who made the various parts, you know. Um, and I said I did to all of them, obviously. Um, and then he snapped the back to, stood up, congratulations, you're a watchmaker. And um, that was amazing. That was, you know, sort of seven years, seven years of, you know, bloody hard work, really, you know, to try and get to that point and... Um, I didn't hear anything he said. He just carried on talking for probably, I don't know, it seemed like 10, 15 minutes. He was just walking around the workshop and I, didn't, I can't remember a word he said. And um, uh, that was it really, that was an extraordinary moment. It is one thing to, to be, you know, like um, working for someone, but to establish your own uh, workshop, to establish that and to get, become independent of your master. How did that establish in your mind working for George, I guess, here on the island of Man? Yeah, so I always had in this idea that I'd be making my own watches again at some point. And so in the last, I suppose, year, 18 months, I was starting to form ideas. So in those days, so the, yeah, as I say, going back to 2001 ish. Yeah. Pocket watches, I mean, so, so he, he'd made his career out of making pocket watches. I think he made about 24 or so pocket watches. There were some prototypes, huh? like uh, it was above 30 with a, with a prototype. Yeah, yeah, yes, and with the wrist watches. Eventually yeah. ah, okay. had to start making wrist watches because the collecting world had completely moved away from pocket watches and it's never returned. I mean, obviously your very best, your very finest pocket watches, you know, there are some great pieces out there. They still have a value. Obviously, George Daniel's pocket watches are going through the roof. Um, but general collecting had gone and is moving over to wristwatches. So I sort of thought, well, I'm going to have to um, move in that direction into the wristwatches. And fortunately, my work on the Millennium Project had been good. That had chased those fears away because it was always a terrifying prospect um, to move to that scale um, I mean it might um, it may this may sound bizarre to people this having this conversation but you've got to remember there was nobody in Britain making watches it's just George and myself that was it that was the watchmaking industry in Britain do you think that that being in a remote place like this, which uh, might remind, uh, remind a little bit of, you know, the Valley de Joux, which is also like, used to be a very, very remote place, uh, is helping uh, you to today in these busy times to, to kind of um, be clearer with your thoughts or be, be um, more straightforward with your product? Without a doubt. I mean, there's, I, I mean, one of my colleagues, Andy Jones here, he went on the Wallstep course when I was starting to make my pocket watch. And um, I do look at the way he progressed and his depth of knowledge, watchmaking knowledge and skills was far outstripped mine. You know, because he'd been on the Wastep course, it was a brilliant training course. And um, me moving into sort of watchmaking and trying to fumble my way through it, of course, it took a long, long time. And had I had that Swiss experience, I think I would have been far more advanced, you know, is, as I say, is a great training. Um, but looking back at it now in the cold light of day, I'm glad I didn't go down that route because 
I would have made friends, acquaintances, relationships that would have changed my watchmaking forever. And um, there's no doubt that had I set out with that knowledge in my head, I would have approached my watchmaking completely differently. And I wouldn't be making the watches I'm making today. I mean, that's, that's, there's no doubt about that. And today, again, I'm very isolated. I'm not in contact with any of these watchmakers. Very nice though they are. Um, and I do occasionally meet them when we bump into each other somewhere, you know, somewhere. But um, I'm glad I don't have that relationship, that ongoing day-to-day -day relationship where you speak to a wheel maker down the road or an escapement maker or a case maker or a dial maker who may influence your design because of the way they make their components. So. What about going out and uh, have a look at some of your pieces? I heard we have three here. Yes. And I cannot wait <laughs> to have a first glimpse on a yeah, Roger Smith watch. Yeah, I'm very happy. Thank Let's you. Have a look. Thank you so much. So, um, right, so, well, obviously three watches here. These are watches which um, are in their test, test period now, uh, prior to delivery to the clients. And um, they are actually all Series 1 watches. And I suppose they're, they're good examples as to how, you know, how much sort of influence the clients can have in each individual watch. So basically this piece here is um, they're all 38 millimeter diameter watches. This one is 18 karat yellow gold cased. And then we have a silver engine turn dial with gold inserts and then uh, blue steel minute, hour and second sands and Roman numeral uh, buttons. And uh, then we flip the movement over and we have this sort of very typical English finish mechanism with its gilded and frosted plates. We have uh, a design there, engine turning design on the raised barrel bridge and the balance cock. Um, gold chatons, blued screws, or this sort of purple blue colour that I like throughout the watches. Um, so that's sort of our, our Series 1 wristwatch. It's an, an intriguing how, how, how three-dimensional it comes because usually you would need immediately a magnifying glass yeah. to, to discover a watch, but here you have the feeling you have the, the three-dimensionality of a, of a pocket watch and a wristwatch. Well, it's interesting that you've pointed that out because um, when I was making the first pocket watches and I was looking at some English pocket watches at the time and um, these watches to me were alive. You know, they, they were... They were Thick watches, very deep, good size. You you didn't really need much of an eyeglass to study right. them right. in detail. And um, at the same time, I was comparing these pocket watches to modern wrist watches, which I was working on in the trade repair work that I was doing. And what I noticed that these uh, mass-produced wrist watches they'd lost that depth of quality, which I was really becoming to appreciate in the pocket watches. And so when I set out um, you know, designing my very first wristwatch, I wanted to put some of these real three-dimensional qualities back into the wristwatch. And it's my take on how the British watchmaking industry continued and moved into wristwatch making, then this is perhaps where they'd be today. So when, that, when did it come up that you, you put the Isle of Man, um, like kind of coat of arms on the watch? Yeah, yeah so that's, um, that's called a Manx, that's a triskillion, yeah. which is a three legs of man, their symbol. So um, I think I put it on the first watch maybe, could have been sort of almost 10 years ago now. Put it on a Daniel's anniversary, that's when we started. Uh, this, the Daniel's anniversary was a series of watches that we started making with George before he passed away. Uh, we're still completing that series, still a few pieces to make. And then we've just um, taken that triskillion idea um, and added it onto our watches. Um, and and if, you, if you look at the, the, the guilloche and, 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 and those details, are they, um, are they linked to, to British watchmaking in a way? Or is that like your personal approach? 
So it's um, so if you look back in history, so engine turning, an engine turn dial was always put on the very finest watches. So Breguet, obviously a real exponent of that. Um, but also British contemporaries of Breguet at the same time, on their very best work, they were adding engine turn dials to their watches. So um, if you look at people like Cole and so on, yeah. or Jump, they all had engine turn dials. That's something that um, has carried on. I mean, George obviously put engine turned onto his dials, onto his watches, and I've carried on using his original equipment as well. How long do you usually have one of those pieces um, in your workshop when they are ready? I mean, well, it's rare to have three. Huh? Well, yeah, you've, you've come at a great, a great time, really. So usually about three, three to four weeks. Yeah. Um, I mean, the watches have already been well tested for many months as the watch has been built up and so on. But um, just after casing, we always like to test them for that sort of period of time and just to make sure everything's right. And... I love this dial design. Mm. It's, it's so, it's readable, like, I mean, look at the, it's a 38, you know, and you go from a distance, mm. you definitely can see this. Yeah, I mean, it's, you, as you say, you get real clarity from it. And this whiteness yeah. is yeah. achieved through heating the dial up yeah, with yeah. a flame. Yeah. And then you, um, it brings this pure silver oxide through to the surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only parts that are that are not possibly not made is the the sapphire, mainspring, mainspring, balance spring, and jewels. Wow, well, yeah. Yeah. Everything else we do in house. Yeah. yeah. So, is there anything you want to be remembered for? Um. Well, I don't think I'll ever be making anything groundbreaking like, you know, George. I don't think you'll see an escapement out of me. I mean, who knows? But um, I think for me, it's just about trying to make watches well, you know, to a standard that simply isn't being made in the industry today. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to build a body of work. Um, and there's another few watches to go into that sort of collection, yeah. as it were. Um, and yeah, I mean, I want to, I mean, I'm now wanting to, I mean, this never set out to be a business, but yeah. I'm now wanting to create a business which, you know, is sustainable and will continue long after I'm sort of gone. But could you imagine to some extent that your uh, children one day would take it up or is that something you would rather withstand and say, no, it's not kind of, I don't want to, establish a family business or a family tradition out of that? Is that something that comes in your mind or because you were the chosen student and not the given kid to yeah, someone? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, th I think for me it's, I mean, if the children are interested, then wonderful, great. Yeah. You know, I'll, and I'll give every help that, yeah. I, you know, I can. Um, but for you, it was also the way you found, and it was not the way your father decided you shouldn't go, huh? Yeah. yeah oh, yes, yes. I mean, I found it, yes. So, you know, if, if they have no interest in watches, that's fine. Yeah. You know, yeah. and yeah. I'm very happy to sort of, you know, walk away from that and um, allow them to, you know, find their own way. Yeah. Um, so, no, very relaxed about that, really. And, um, um, Oh, we're going to. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I was left to my own devices to a certain, I mean, I was guided, there's no doubt about it, but my father. But, you know, I think this, this world of watchmaking, you have to be really engaged in it to make a success of it. You can't come into it half-heartedly. I suppose like any profession, isn't it? You know, you have to really commit to it to make it happen and work, really. But if they want to come into it and change the business into whatever they, you know, if, if they do want to increase numbers, it's up to them. You know, I can only do what I, yeah, yeah. what I'm able to do. But I do appreciate that other people have different ideas. And so if they did get involved and it did change, that's great, you know, fully support them and what they're trying to achieve, really. Mm -hmm.